Well, I guess I, I feel that way, for instance, like when I'm sculpting hair, you know, just something that always shifts. It feels so much harder for me, not, not necessarily because it's like the trickiest thing to sculpt, but because you have to be making intentional decisions where in other areas, maybe the visual information is more stable and is making those, those decisions for you. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I, I totally agree. Cause I'm realizing like, Whoa, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. If I don't know what I'm looking at, then like I'm, I'm making like a, a puffy cloud. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Balls, so you know? easy to do with drapery. Yeah. Um, so it's been, it's definitely been an experience for me of like, uh, just learning sort of the dynamics of drapery or some of the consistent rules, let's say, and like the structure is the best way to put it. Like almost like anatomy, you know, mm -hmm. like, and starting to be able to name the parts. And then when you look at something, you can sort of anticipate what's happening and what's going to happen. And uh, it leads to like a, just a strong design. Yeah. That's such an interesting process. But yeah, I, I definitely, I struggle so much with that stuff. Like anything, yeah, that really is, I feel like a design choice. I just have so much less experience in. So yeah feel a little lost yeah it's um that's it's a great opportunity to be there and uh, like again just want to give Sabin his props for keeping the design open to this stage um because he could have like closed it down let's say or made decisions at a smaller scale and then let this large scale process be a lot less dynamic yeah um but actually talking to him it's like this is the moment that he's actually been waiting for you know this is like four years in the making to get to the stage where he's sculpting again because he's done almost i think it's almost four years three or four years of of design work between the drawing and then the small maquettes to get to this final moment where the full scale thing is being made. And it actually took us a long time in the studio as the, uh, the sculptors that are not Satan. I, I'll just say for me, it took me a while to actually recognize that he's Sabin is giving us the freedom to take this foam that looks pretty good that they've enlarged from a maquette mm -hmm. and just go to town on it. Like there's nothing that has to be kept on from this foam. Yeah. Besides obviously like the major gesture and proportion. Yeah. We're going to stick with that pose. But other than that, <laughs> you can see, there was like total freedom to take the razor blade and start just chopping big sections of the foam away. Yeah. And, you know, when we first started, I think I was a little timid to make big decisions like that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's super exciting the moment that we're at now because we've kind of come around the corner having dealt with this first group of figures and kind of looking at them like, all right, this was the first round. And we still have a couple months to really finish them. And then yeah. We've got the next group coming up and I'm even more excited to like start from scratch again on those guys. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Like each time your process gets better or oh, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. these next ones, we're going to just, yeah, be, uh, they're going to be stronger. They're going to be stronger, but they're also like as a group, it's the battle scene group. So they're like the most active, and that's the center panel of or the, like the uh, it's not quite the center it, it's like more the second quarter okay and you guys i saw you're sending it to you're sending it to a foundry in the uk yeah is that yeah. it's called pangolin and um 
uh, they do the 3D and the casting and mold making. It's just totally a full service place. I haven't been there, but some of the models went and they're saying as non artists, they're saying like this place is like a wonderland. I guess it's giant. They do everything like behind every door they looked in, there was something unique happening, you know? Yeah. That's pretty awesome. I know I always mispronounce his name. It's Nick, it's Nick Bibby or Nick Babby. Uh, uh -huh. uh, He's, yeah. you know, he's a really well-known animal sculptor, but he, I know he uses them and they've made some oh. like amazing, amazing stuff with his work. And like their, their patinas are really incredible too. Mm. I bet I can imagine. Cause actually the design of the foam armature that we're working on is incredible. And it, the, so they're shipping it right back and forth. It's a giant wall. It's split up into sections. And all the figures, like I described before, break up off the wall. And they all slide on. They have iron uh, holes in the back. And they slide on like a, it's a square pipe. Mm -hmm. that they can slide on to like a big rolling armature. But yeah, those guys designed this like system of super easy to use. It breaks down for shipping, and it's super light. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, that actually, that goes kind of to one of the comments about mm. connecting this back to St. Gaudens yeah. about sculpture being a collaborative process. Yeah. Where, at, at least in my experience, even, I guess, yeah, like people like Saban, where he is the sculptor, he has his hand in all of this, but there's no way he could singularly produce yeah. this stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's the case for most, most prolific sculptors or sculptors working on bigger projects is there inevitably these collaborative jobs. And if you have a foundry like Pangolin, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. Then that's really nice. Like you really, you really <laughs> want to trust the people you're working with. Yeah. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that collaborative. I love it. I mean, it was definitely one of the decisions when I was getting really serious about sculpture and thinking, is this something I want to do like for the rest of my life? I, one of the very big positives was that you get to work with groups of people, you know? Uh, I was, like I said, you know, doing a lot of landscape painting and it's true i like the idea of like being able to just roll out in your van and like pop out <laughs> and be by yourself and like sit in a field and paint but um i definitely like the collaborative process of it you know there's just so many opportunities to learn from people you know i think that's a little more to my nature uh even the models that we're working with, they happen to be actors and I, I'm picking up a lot from them just about what their career is like and, and it's really interesting. Like, so I'm learning from other kinds of artists, you know, in that space, collaborating on the sculpture itself. Uh, but then there are, I think this ties to like using models instead of using photos in the studio. Mm -hmm. There's a certain element of the collaborative process that comes through in the final piece. That's a little intangible. Like, you know, sometimes I guess I would hear people say like, it's the, if you use a model, it's the life force and the energy, like you can see it. And yeah. You know, from my experience, maybe I would call some of it the, like, anxiety of <laughs> making and like, trying to get that fold before, like, the model gets tired and then they're going to have to take a break, you know? But yeah. there's a certain, in that situation, there's a certain, like, attention and focus I know that I have to have in that moment to get it. And there's, it makes the design dynamic because I can communicate with the model and um, like 
try out different situations, push a little further back, push a little further forward with your hips, turn this way a little bit more, put a little weight on your toe. And um, that all comes through somehow, you know? It's, the, it's a little edge that comes through, but I think overall it's, it's visible when you like compare works that have a model are based on working with the model and not. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. Like for me, I would call it like an intuitive sense of the person or what is happening that maybe you don't have enough information to pick up yeah. in a photograph. And then also I really, I really felt what you were saying about sort of, sort of the stress of of time when you're working with a model because they're there and that time is such a, a currency. I really felt what you were saying about sort of, sort of the stress of of time when you're working with a model because they're there and that time is such a, a currency. It's really easy when you're working. I feel this when I work from photographs where that photo is there forever. It's not going to move. It's not going to shift you know the interaction with it is limited and so yeah. it's really easy for me to just sort of check out and not have that like really really intense attention drive to understand and capture something in a moment and you know and then when uh, you start to get tired <laughs> you take a coffee break and you make coffee together and like you chat about something else then you come back to it you know i like, think that solidarity when you're in something with other people too, that pull gives you so much more energy. One of the reasons too I like sculpture is the collaborative nature of it. And the collective drive feels so much bigger, yeah. fuller, you, I don't know. <laughs> remember like in the GCA sculpture hall, how it would get really chatty, like we would start chatting. And mm -hmm. I think, I started to realize it's because if you have a model in the middle who's doing a portrait, who's posing for a portrait, all the sculptors are on different sides of them like this. And we're looking at the model and then right behind the model, there's <laughs> someone else, you know, looking back. So you're constantly yeah. like face to face with people. Yeah. Uh, and that just leads to like that collective kind of buzz, you know. I, I definitely feel that. You don't want to take up too much of your time. I know this is supposed to be like half an hour, and I think we've gone over that, but I just wanted to touch, if you don't mind, on the idea of conceptual form, because I feel like what you're doing now is sort of hitting pretty heavily on that, and I was just wondering how, how you think about... Actually, this is something that I'm just really personally <laughs> interested in. Just... Again, because I feel like we're inundated with so much two-dimensional media, yeah. I've had students and people ask me how, how you conceive of form or depth. Like, how do you judge it? How, how do you conceptualize it, or what does that mean to you? Yeah, that's a big question. It is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's, like, it's definitely the most fun thing. There's so many ways to approach that question. That's why I'm like, how do I approach it right now? Uh, the quick answer that Che used to talk about, it's like the way that I think it was introduced to me was like, uh, imagine from your point of view and then imagine from another point of view. So from you're looking forward, but imagine what you would see if you look from the top and be able to like conceive of that from this point of view. And so you're engaging like two perspectives at once. And that's super challenging. It takes a lot of mental energy all the time, but I love doing that. And I think, I think people actually can do that better than they realize, you know, like just by moving around, you're kind of always aware of depth for the most part. You know, if you played sports, if you rode a bike, if you walk to the grocery store, whatever. <laughs> the more specific answer, I guess, in terms of more nuanced kind of maybe academic 
discussion, I would say, in drawing and sculpting is just like having an understanding of the form in your mind and then rebuilding it. So the idea is that whatever thing I see, uh, let's just say, take a portrait, like if I'm looking at the nose, as I'm recreating that nose on my sculpture, instead of just looking at it and uh, responding to it visually, I'm like actually trying to construct a mental model of what the shape and like the relative proportion of all the parts are. And then I'm recreating that. So it's almost like sculpting in the dark like as if there was no light, just the pure form of it, trying to understand that. And then in the situation at the studio with Sabin, it's the next level is like, where are the high points of the form? Um, sometimes, like, is there an opportunity to push that? And in the terms of relief, you have to keep track of all those high points and say, do I need to compress these here or can I expand them here? And how does it fit into sort of an imaginary space, you know, that's yeah. not one-to-one -one with reality? I mean, but that's where it's complicated. But also, because there's no answer, it's, it's just play in a way as well. It would be complicated if it was a huge puzzle and there was an answer. But yeah. because art, it's a huge puzzle and there's no answer. For me, I try to just let go of that, get to that place where I can just freely play around with it. The best answer is if Sabin likes it or not. <laughs> <laughs> which actually you should say yeah there's like a story and a big concept of the design that he's come up with and does that specific little arrangement of form in that space help that story or not that's like the best way to choose if that's right or wrong i will i like where we're coming from with it and i like having the conversation with you about it because the way that we learned to draw was based on that idea of like being able to really understand the form, a less impressionistic style of drawing and a more like tactile style of drawing. I'm finding that being in the studio with Sabin is just a continuation of that same way of thinking. And so it's super fun, you know, it's just a, <laughs> There are a lot of different ways to sculpt, but that's kind of how we're approaching it. And, and like I said, it's just kind of fun to play with space. It's like once you can kind of track some of the things, you can start to have a little bit of control. I love the way you put that. Maybe it's, it's from going to Grand Central Atelier. I just think I tend to be like overly serious sometimes about my approach but I think that freedom or play that willingness to experiment is what pushes anything forward and I love that you said it was like play I mean, the more that I look at good art I'm realizing like there's no within the figurative and realistic realm of things even though people say it's such like a strict tradition and you have to copy what's there and it has to look, there's really so much space to be creative. There's no rules. I was looking at this, um, Michelangelo, the, this is the battle <laughs> of the centaurs. That's like, I don't know how old he was when we did that, but they say it was really young. I don't even want to say it out loud, but it was younger than 18. <laughs> I was looking at that and, the, the space is like, like all over the place. I mean, people are like like emerging out of the background in a way that's not mm, realistic, but he was just playing around with form, you know? And that's what's so cool about it. Even with like the anatomy of his work, it's not true to life. It's his play or interpretation of it. So is there... Is there websites or um, social media accounts to follow you or save a project we've just talked about? Um, my Instagram is at CS 
Mostow, M-O-S-T-O-W, that's my last name, Charles Straley Mostow. Tracy Saban's wife calls me Charles Straley, so she calls me by my formal name. <laughs> and, my name. <laughs> and Saban's, I think it's Saban Howard Sculpture, Saban yeah. Howard, S-A-B-I-N, Howard. And then there's the World War I Centennial Commission, who are the organization that actually commissioned this relief. They have an Instagram and they have a website, which is World War I Centennial Commission.org, which mm-hmm. is good because they're sharing a lot about the, the whole project as a whole. They have the plans for the park and the construction of the rest of the park is underway. And they have interview with the landscape architect. So it's a good place to go for just like a broad view reference of what's happening. But the whole project is going to be unveiled November 2023. And there'll be a big unveiling. We're all looking forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk and to go so in depth about your process. Yeah, I appreciate, you know, you asking and it's good to be able to open up about it and uh, talk with another sculptor. And I just wish Augustus St. Gaudens was here to talk with us. <laughs> That'd be great. A lot to say too. <laughs> we went to Prospect Park last weekend and took our dog and then we were looking at... Uh, there's a Daniel Chester French relief and uh, McMoney's was St. Gaudens assistant. And he did these gates, the, the horse tamer sculptures. And then there's like some Stanford white columns. Mm-hmm. And just to be at this moment where both you and I have done and are doing work that's like part of the American sculpture tradition is kind of amazing. So I'm excited to have been able to share and like be just at least part of that ongoing discussion. It's pretty amazing. I feel like so lucky to to do what I do and then to have this direct connection to St. Gaudens, one of the biggest names, if not the biggest in American sculpture Definitely. is, yeah. yeah, pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. If I could say one thing, um, yeah to the kids out there it's that you know from the outside especially when i was thinking about being a sculptor the the kind of overall vibe was like you were kind of getting at figurative sculpture like there's not a lot of that going on but now that i'm on the inside of it it's like a big community. There actually is in all the cities across the country, there's bronze figurative stuff happening. And then when you expand a little bit further outward, well, if you break into the TV, movie, 3D, figurative industry is huge. Uh, there's like a lot going on, you know? And so if there's any inspired and aspiring figure sculptors out there, I'm just like super encouraging of everyone that wants to do it because it's fun. And if that's how you feel about it, there's a lot to be a part of that's happening right now. It's it's not like it was done 150 years ago and that's it. But the work is there. Yeah, there's stuff going on. And there's like communities it, part of it is the work and part of it is just like people pushing the ideas forward, you know? I feel like that's a good, a good sentiment to, to head out on just because I feel like there is sort of an idea of a starving artist or uh-huh. arts not being a realistic career option or a field to yeah. go into. Once you're in it, you realize, like you were just saying, how much there is available. There definitely is. And... One day, I hope to go to the St. Gaudens site and be inspired. Places like that are important. Just keep a little vision, a place of sort of vision of the past and help push it forward too. So thank you. 
Well, thank you, St. Gaudens National Historical Park, for facilitating this. And thank you again, Charlie. Yes, thank you.